J. Vernon McGee told, uh, told a story about the time he was on a trip to South Africa. And uh, he was walking around, and he, he, he saw, one, in one small town, he saw, uh, came upon a group of boys who were playing marbles. And since he had grown up playing marbles, he thought that was pretty cool. So he went over to join them and see what they were doing. And he noticed when he, when he came there uh, to the boys that were playing marbles, he noticed that they were playing with stones rather than marbles. So he looked a little closer, and he discovered that the stones were diamonds. They were playing marbles with diamonds. And he makes the comment, and I make the comment today, that we as preachers can sometimes do that with our sermons. We can preach superficial sermons using words of infinite value and end up playing marbles with diamonds. I can remember the very first sermon I ever preached. It is indelibly imprinted on my mind. It was my freshman year at Bible College at Philadelphia College of Bible, now Cairn University. And I was back for a break. My dad, as pastor of the church, said, OK, you can, you can preach, United Baptist Church of Old Town, Maine. He's wanted me to preach. I thought, this is great. So I prepared this sermon. I worked hard all week. It's 1 Corinthians 13. I was prepping and developing all kinds of information. Man, I had so much stuff. It was going to be impressive. <laughs> Not. Within five minutes, I'd lost everybody. I was stringing pearls together, verse by verse, going through all of this information, phrase by phrase, all kinds of stuff. But there was no purpose, no point to what I was doing. I was playing marbles with diamonds. One of the criticisms of expository preaching is that we explain the facts of the text and never capture the thrust of the text. We give people lots of biblical information that seems irrelevant to them, and we call it expository preaching. We comment verse by verse, but there's no point to what we're doing. The sermon is aimless. Every unit of thought in Scripture has a point. Biblical units of thought are never pointless. That is a very important concept. Now, I'm not talking about the big idea or a central idea or having a nice proposition. I'm not talking about any of those things. Those are important, of course. And when we study, we try to come up with what is the main idea here that we're going to preach. But that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about the thrust of the passage. God's purpose in his word is to change lives. Amen? Application, not information, is the goal of preaching. We're not speaking to the academic world, but to the factory world. Our audience is not the classroom at a college or seminary, but the break room in the office building. So transformational preaching begins with aim. What are we trying to accomplish with this sermon? What is this sermon supposed to do? I occasionally do consults with pastors. I had a pastor that wanted me to do a consult with him, and so I listened to his message, and then we, we met to talk about it. The message was full of biblical information, 
great exegesis, great understanding of the passage, great information for the people. He'd explained the facts of the text very well. But the problem with the sermon was it didn't have any what I call prick power, prick power, no point. And so I asked him, what is it you wanted this sermon to do in the lives of the people? And he was shocked by the question. He didn't have an answer. W. Sangster, an old Methodist preacher, tells a story about a young man whose turn it came to preach before the theological college where he was studying. And afterwards, he was called back to the president's office. And that's not usually a good thing to turn in his manuscript. And the president sat there with the manuscript, and the whole room was filled with frigid silence for quite a while. And finally, the young man burst out, it will do, sir, won't it? It will do. Do what, snapped the president. Do what? That, brothers, is the most important question for the preacher. We can have all the content, we can know all the biblical information, the theological truths, but what will this sermon do? Brian Chappell says, without the so what, we preach to a who cares. That's a great line. During my years of teaching homiletics at the, in the college classroom, I, I required students to turn in full manuscripts to me a week ahead of preaching the sermon in class. And I often returned those sermon manuscripts to the students with big red words, two words, so what? So what? The missing ingredient in many otherwise good sermons is purpose. So we're here today to talk about transformational preaching, and that starts with purpose. That starts with your aim. Every sermon should have a target, an aim, a purpose that you are trying to accomplish. Before we get into some of this stuff, let me stop for a minute to review the model for expository preaching that I teach here at, at Rephidim. I call it the Saffins model. The Saffins funnel, state it, aim it, frame it, nail it, seal it. We are obviously not going to cover all that today. We're going to focus strictly on some aspects of the second section, aim it. State it, aim it, frame it, nail it, seal it. But we're looking at aim it today. Today's preachers face twin challenges. Every one of you guys faces two big challenges every time you preach. The first is biblical illiteracy. And the second is chronic distractibility. Studies have shown that 40% of Christians now who attend church regularly, these are our parishioners, these are the people who are there Sunday in and Sunday out, 40% of Christians who attend church regularly read the Bible once a month or less. Biblical illiteracy. Our, our churches are, are increasingly biblically illiterate. And their attentions are constantly distracted. I mean, the statistics are mind boggling. In 2022, 4.48 billion people, almost 4.5 billion people, used social media globally. That's up from 2 billion just seven years ago. The average person today has 8.4 social media accounts, almost double the amount from 2014. I have a hard time thinking of eight plus social media accounts, but they're there. The average person now spends two hours and 25 minutes every day on social media, bouncing around. 
If a person starts at 16 and continues on social media until they are 70, they will spend 5.7 years of their life on social media. 72% of the American population has social media accounts, and that is growing over 4% every year. Now, I'm not knocking social media. I'm not saying this is the devil or it's evil or something like that. I'm just saying that people are chronically distracted. They are caught up with whatever is flowing through the news feeds and the, and the social media uh, feeds that they are constantly checking. They're chron chronically distracted, and they come to church that way. That's who they are. So... Men, you face the two challenges of biblical illiteracy and chronic distractibility every time you preach a sermon. Now, what's a sermon to do? When communication theorists talk about purpose, they call it rhetorical stance. Your rhetorical stance relates to the way you view your message and your audience. There are three elements involved in every message. Apart, now, this is apart from God. God's the superintending power behind all of this. But there are three elements involved in every sermon. The preacher, the Bible, and the listener. <coughs> The Holy Spirit then sovereignly oversees those elements, and we trust in that. But those are the elements. So each message, each sermon is unique because the variables change. Even though the content of the Bible does not, does not change. So this does not change, but these variables change. Preaching is always a dynamic, not a static process. The sermon is not done in the study. It's done in the moment of delivery. It's done with people. I don't know about you, but if you've tried to preach, and I do this on podcasts and stuff like that, you try to preach, but there's no audience there, right? It is a weird thing. You have to kind of create the audience in your head. Preaching was designed to be with people. That's when the message takes place. The audience changes. Whoops, here we go. The audience changes, so the sermon changes. If I'm preaching to a group of senior citizens, the sermon is going to change. If I'm preaching to a group of pastors, the sermon is going to change. Not the, not the Bible but how I deliver it and how I deal with it, young people, whatever it is. So this changes, and I change, and those are the variables. Now, there are three rhetorical stances that preachers can take. The first is called, we call the lecture stance. In the lecture stance, People live in the here and now, but the preacher invites them to look at what happened back then and over there in the Bible and all of that, and the preacher is looking at all of that information as well. And they're talking about all of that stuff that happened back then over there. The message is usually delivered in the third person, so it's they did this, God did that, back then years ago, and usually the, you can always tell a lecture stance message pretty quickly because the points of the sermon will be in the third person and it's all about how God changed people and what he did dramatically years ago in Jeremiah's day or whatever. And so you see points of the sermon say something like, Moses trusted God. Moses obeyed God. That's a lecture stance sermon. Paul prayed for the Philippians. That's a lecture stance sermon. It's about them over there back then. 
The second kind of stance is the felt need stance. And that's all about life today. The preacher talks about us from the Bible and what God is doing in, for, and through us today. And the preacher talks in the first and second person. So it's, it's all about me, I, or you as people. And often excellent communication skills combined with a style crafted to appeal to a target audience help the preacher connect with people. These are life app sermons. They're all about us here and now. And oftentimes, the preacher is spending a lot of time talking about himself and his experiences to connect with the people so that they understand, he understands what they're going to, through. So, a, Attractional Christianity, which is very popular today, attractional Christianity starts this way. It, it, is, it is preach what the people want to hear. It is finding out what will connect me with them and focusing on that. And it's all in the here and now, and God does thus and so for us. And the Bible just becomes a resource it's not the source of the message anymore. It's a resource that I use to do and say what I want to say. So the preacher comes up with the topics, the ideas that will connect with people, and then looks to the Bible texts that he can find that will fit those ideas. David Helm has a great line about this. He says, some preachers use the Bible the way a drunk uses a lamppost, more for support than illumination. <laughs> I like that. Bridge stance. Here's what we want to do. Unless you as the preacher, unless me as a preacher, unless we're being constantly transformed by the Word of God, we will never preach transformationally. That's why I love what Russ did at the start of today, because he was talking about who we are. Who we are matters. If, if we are not genuinely being transformed by God, even in the times of crisis and pain, if that's not happening in our lives, we cannot expect any kind of transformation to take place in the lives of the people through our preaching. So the preacher becomes the bridge from the world of the Bible over there to the world of the people here and now. Uh, you probably have heard this expression, but it, Phillips Brooks famously said, that preaching is truth through personality. Truth through personality. Who you are. That's where the truth comes through to the people. So call it incarnational preaching. We're fleshing out God's word. People today need to know that, that, it's, that we're authentic, that we're genuine. So authenticity comes because we're fleshing out the word that we're learning and studying and therefore preaching. The Word of God becomes incarnate in us. And the Bible becomes the source of our ideas, not just a resource we use to say what we want to say. And the people are challenged to look at the scriptures to understand their needs. And the preacher identifies the contemporary life parallels, the CLPs that will relate to them. And the message actually moves back and forth between the two worlds as the preacher forms the connecting bridge. Authority, where does authority come from? It comes from the Bible. It comes from God's word. It doesn't come from us. And so we must make sure that the ideas we're preaching are grounded there. Too often, and I hope I'm not talking to any of you when I say this, but certainly in our culture today, too often preachers sell out the authority of God's word. In fact, I'm convinced that lots of people preaching today don't even believe it, that God's word is authoritative. They want relevancy. So they sell out the authority of God's word to be relevant to our world. And the temptation of every one of us as preachers, and it's very seductive, 
the temptation of every preacher is to make ourselves the authority instead of the Bible. Men, we create a sermon. We don't invent the message. That's his. And the authority comes from that. People talk a lot about relevance. You've got to be relevant today. Well, I am firmly convinced that true relevance flows out of authority, and authority flows out of the Bible. So relevance comes from the Bible as we shine its light on the world today. That's where real relevance comes from. You don't have to be experts on everything in our culture to be relevant. What we need to be is experts on the Bible and how that relates to our culture. So how do we do this process then of developing purpose, the target for our sermons? How do we develop a specific purpose for a specific sermon? We start by balancing needs. And there's two factors we have to balance. We have to balance the needs of the people, and we have to balance the needs of the passage. So we have to exegete the passage, and we have to exegete the people. And so we have to look at their needs, but we have to look at the needs of the text. We must know the people to whom we speak, and we must know the Bible that speaks to them. So we may start with some felt needs that people have, but we don't stop with felt needs. You know, the Bible does not address everybody's felt need. There are lots of felt needs that the Bible does not address. But the Bible addresses every real need that anybody has. As pastors, then, we become spiritual diagnosticians as we try to address, understand the needs of the people and how that connects with the needs of the passage. So where the needs of the passage intersect with the needs of the people, that's the target for that sermon. And every sermon is different because you've got a text and you've got people and you want to know where those cross, those needs intersect. And transformational preaching requires us to know the target for each sermon. What do you want that sermon, this sermon, to do? If we don't have a target, we're going to hit it every time. But it won't be transformational preaching. So let's dig a little deeper and unpack the process for finding the target for each sermon we preach. What do we want our sermon to do? Let's start with passage needs. Shallow ideas produce shallow sermons, and shallow sermons produce shallow Christians. Jerry Vines and Jim Saddix call it the difference between preaching God's stuff and good stuff. Sometimes we're preaching good stuff, but it isn't God's stuff. Randall Pelton calls it the difference between preaching big ideas or preaching small ideas. So where do small ideas come from? They come from me. They come from you. Where do big ideas come from? From God in his word. When our sermons are based on Google searches and felt needs, they're going to be small ideas. Where do the big ideas come from? The word of God, and that's where we go to find them. Isaiah 55, 10, and 11, God's word does its work. So when we're dealing with passage needs, there are two factors that we have to address in terms of the needs of the passage. Exegesis and pragmatics. Expository preaching means a lot of things to a lot of people, I think. The term's used kind of loosely. 
But I believe that expository preaching exposes the meaning and significance of a biblical unit of thought for our modern audience with the intent to persuade them to change in some way. The intention is to persuade. We expose the word. Transformation is the goal. Exposition is the means to that goal. So the theological foundation for expository preaching so if we're going to understand the methodology, we have to understand the foundation. Preaching as Bible exposition rests on a three-legged stool. Exegetical theology, biblic exegetical, biblical theology, and pericopal theology. This afternoon, I'm going to address pericopal theology. This morning, we're touching on exegetical theology. Uh, biblical theology is a very important leg of the stool, but we don't have time to deal with that today, and, and, and I'd love to. It's, it's wonderful. Biblical theology deals with the progressive revelation of God's Word, understanding each segment, segment of the Bible that has to relate to the organic unity of the whole. And it's a very rich and wonderful subject and I'd love to get into that, but we don't have time. So today, we're going to focus on whoop, here we go, exegetical theology, and this afternoon, pericopal theology. Exegesis. What is it? It's reading God's meaning out of the text. Eisegesis is reading our meaning into the text. The preachers must use the Bible as the source for what we say. Exegesis, not a resource for what we want to say, eisegesis. Unfortunately, much evangelical preaching today has fallen into the swamp of subjectivity. The Bible means whatever I want it to mean. However the Bible speaks to me, that's God's word for me. However the Bible speaks to you, that's God's word for you. There is no objective standard for determining what the Bible means for many people. Exegetical theology is becoming a lost skill. As preachers focus on philosophical theology in their preparation to preach, I often hear people say, why do you spend all of that time analyzing the text? Focus on the philosophical issues that people face today and talk about those things so you'll be relevant. Exegetical theology says, no, you're going to find relevance when you focus on the text itself. The only way out of the swamp of subjectivity, that is, the Bible means what it, what it means to you, and the Bible means what it means to me, and who cares if those aren't the same meaning, is to recover the belief, and this is exegetical theology at its core, is to recover the belief in the singular meaning of Scripture. The singular meaning of Scripture. Every Bible text has only one meaning. That's exegetical theology. Now, we're not talking about figurative language or figures of speech. We understand that those things have multiple meanings. We're talking about you know, the basics of the text, singular meaning. Exegetical theology argues that the meaning is what it meant to the original author and his audience, not what it means to me. Interpretation is de determining what the meaning is in the original context by the original writer. Application is what is the sense for me today. 
there's only one meaning. There are many applications. The plurality is in the application. So keeping interpretation and application separate is vital to the foundation of exegetical theology. Now, we can argue about a text and the meaning of that text. That's fine. We can disagree that this text means this or it doesn't mean this, as long as we maintain the conviction for both of us that there's only one meaning. And I might be right, or you might be right, but there's one meaning. That's exegetical theology. Now, exegesis is how we deal with the needs of the passage. The second element is pragmatics, often not understood today. We, most of us, you guys, most of you, I think, understand exegesis and deal with that. But pragmatics. So exegesis deals with semantics and syntax. Pragmatics deals with purpose and intention. All scripture is intentionally transhistorical, meaning that its purpose goes beyond their world to our world. The transhistorical nature of scripture is foundational to preaching. Paul emphasized that famously, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is useful, utilitarian. It's transhistorical. So we have to understand the world behind the text, but we preach to the world in front of the text, to use Abraham Caravilla's words. Incidentally, let me recommend a book if you want to delve more thoroughly into pragmatics. Abraham Caravilla's book, Privilege the Text, a theological hermeneutic for preaching. That'll get you deep into this business of pragmatics and how it works. I'm just going to summarize some things here. But good exegesis requires us to understand the text in its original context. That's the world behind the text. But we must explain the significance of that text for our audience today. That's the world in front of the text. That's who we preach to. So exegesis is vital for good preaching, but exegesis is not a sermon. The central idea is not a sermon. The the sermon must move from what it meant to them in their day to what it means to us today. God intends this transhistorical nature of scripture to be transformational. We can move from information to application. That's the role of pragmatics. So exegesis deals with what the author is saying, pragmatics deals with with what the author is doing by what the author is saying. Those are two different questions. Suppose my wife tells me, the trash can is full. Now what's she telling me? Yeah, but a semantic analysis of that statement, an exegetical analysis of that statement, the trash can is full, would lead me to say, hmm, let me examine this trash can here. The contents, those are interesting contents. The way the trash can was made, that's interesting. The way it's overflowing and which items are overflowing and not overflowing, that's very interesting. Am I getting what she's telling me? Not a bit. I will, very quickly. That's pragmatics. She made a statement, but there was a pragmatic purpose to the statement. She wasn't just telling me the trash can is full. She was telling me, take out the trash. Well, the same thing happens in our preaching an awful lot. Now, non-expository sermons don't care about this business at all because they're just going to say what they want to say anyway and go where they want to go anyway. But if we want to preach the big ideas of the Word of God, we need to understand that what God is doing by what He is saying. And unfortunately, a lot of sermons be- 
become basically like an analysis of the full trash can. Delve into the explanation of that trash can and all the contents and all the semantics and all the theology and all the information about it. The exegesis is solid, but the sermon doesn't have divine purpose. That's pragmatics. What God wants to do with the text is lost in the sermon. Ignoring the intent of the original author to do what we want to do with the sermon means that we lose sight of God's purpose in our preaching. And abusing the intention of the author places the preacher above the Spirit of God. There is a purpose for every part of Scripture. And it's our job to figure out what God wants to do with what we are studying in the Word of God. So we're asking what is the pragmatic thrust of the passage? What does God want to do with this passage? Not the big idea, not the proposition. We want to know what God's objective is for us based on the intent of the original author as he wrote his, his, audience, his uh, message. So take your Bibles, turn to Matthew at chapter 18, and with somebody nearby, read through that text. And you're going to be answering the question, what is the pragmatic thrust of the passage? Not the main idea. What is it God wants to do with this section of Scripture? So, passage needs deals with exegesis and pragmatics. People needs deals with significance and CLP, or contemporary life parallels. So we, we, can't, just stay, we can't just stay up here. We've got to deal with this stuff here in order for the sermon to be transformational. John Stott was speaking years ago with two brothers who had grown up in a strong Christian home. One brother was a student at Oxford University. The other brother was a student at Edinburgh University. And both had totally rejected the Christian faith, totally rejected it. One was an atheist. The other was an agnostic, even though they grew up in Christian homes. So we asked them, what happened? Was it that they no longer believed that Christianity was true? And they both said, no, that's not the issue. In fact, they said, even if someone were to prove to them that Christianity was true, it wouldn't matter a bit. What we want to know, they said, is not whether Christianity is true, but whether it's relevant. That's a question that haunts every preacher every time you preach. You can maintain truth, but the person sitting out there is saying, what does this have to do with me? They could not see how such an ancient teaching could have any relevance in the modern world. Now, multiple surveys in recent years have demonstrated that most people choose the church they attend based on the preaching. These are the people who go to church now, not the non-Christians, based on the preaching. And a Gallup poll found that 76% of people chose to attend church because of sermons that teach the Bible. They want to know about the Bible. And 75% chose the church because the sermons were relevant to life. What does that tell you? You got to have Bible, you got to have relevancy. Those are the two things you have to have when you're preaching. The twin themes of Bible and relevancy are still central to what we do today. So connecting the Bible to life is foundational to transformational preaching. And that leads us to the questions of significance and CLP or contemporary life parallel. Let's talk about significance first of all. The transhistorical intention of authors is, it occurs in many uh, literature. It's, it's in the classics. It's in all, all kinds of literature that intend. Aesop's fables is transhistorical because he always wrote with a lesson. 
The Constitution is transhistorical. So when we talk about the transhistorical nature of Scripture, we're ensuring, and I'm going to say something kind of technical here, but ensures that the text retains a stable meaning across time and circumstances while becoming unstable in the plurality of ways that it's used in the modern world, the readers. If there is an objective and singular meaning for each text, then we must distinguish between the meaning and its significance. Meaning is, signif is singular, significance is plural. Now methodologically, we must then distinguish between interpretation and application. So authorial intent, Moses, when he wrote Deuteronomy, his intent governs meaning, making it both objective and singular. But application is the method by which we determine the significance of the text for our audience. So interpretation is text-driven. You've got to know what the meaning is first. But application is audience-driven. We move from meaning to interpretation, from meaning to significance by crossing the principalizing bridge. So principalizing is expanding the meaning of the original author into a universal truth or principle applicable to our lives today. So you've got the world behind the text, their world, you got our world, you got to cross that bridge, you do so by creating principles that are universal and touch on lives. Principles bridge from their world to our world. Principles have to be exegetically honest, but must reflect the transhistorical intention of the original author. So the thrust of the passage guides us to the principles. Now, when we deal with principalizing, we always end up, almost always, in exemplification. So in order, you, you create principles, but you, you have to give concrete exem exemplars or examples, and we end up in exemplification in order to get to significance. At this point, our preaching process will arrive at the, the reality of plurality. That is, uh, there is a plurality of significance. So I can, cre I can take their world, understand it well, create a principle that bridges to our world. But once I enter this process, now the significance is plural. And there are lots of ways I can go with that. An exemplar, by the way, is a moral example, an example used in scripture or an example we use in our preaching to teach a moral truth. That's all an exemplar is. Now, it's not moralizing as long as you remember that Christ has to enable us, but exemplification is, is used often in the New Testament. The New Testament writers used exemplars quite frequently. Now, let me talk about this for a minute with a, a hotly debated subject today, and I don't want to get into gun debates, but I'm going to use the gun debate as an example because people hotly debate the significance of the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution. Now, you understand the United States Constitution is a transhistorical document. It was intended, it was written originally Original meaning, original intentions, all that. But it was written to do something down through history to our lives today. So originalists point to the original meaning of the phrase right to bear arms. They're going to focus on this phrase. And now I'm going to move down this process, eventually trying to bridge to our world. OK, I can buy a rifle. Well, you know, now you get into some things that they didn't have then, but they were their arms, so I have a right to buy a, buy a rifle. And now I'm going to get into an example 
I have a right to buy an AR-15 style rifle. So you see what's happening here is I'm moving from an interpretation of their world to examples that now relate to my world that they would have no knowledge about, of course. And I'm going to end up with some interesting debates over what that actually means today. The debate isn't over this end. The debate is over significance. Same thing is happening when we preach. We're going to move through this process. We're going to create examples. We're going to create a principle. We're going to deal with our lives today. But now we're dealing with significance. And there's a plurality of significance. You can go a variety of ways with that. And you can even argue about what its significance of that text is for today. Others can and will disagree with a sermon that, that you preach that might use an example from today. And somebody might say, wait a minute, I don't see where that tracks. They're not debating the interpretation. They're debating the significance. If they're debating the interpretation, that's a different issue. Do you see the difference between meaning and significance? And where we're going to preach transformationally is in significance. That's where the rubber hits the road. That's where people live. So we're going to deal all the time with significance. So you, you, you develop a sermon. You get all of this information. You get all of this. But if you don't get to significance, there's going to be no transformational preaching here. So you have to go there. The biblical text is inspired. The significance we make of that text in our sermons, guys, that's not inspired. <laughs> That's not inspired. We want it to be accurate. All right, that's significance. Now, contemporary life parallel, CLP, has to do with contextualization. It refers to the process of taking a religious principle in one culture and making it significant in another culture. I mean, missionaries have to do this all the time. A missionary from America has to learn the religious principles, but has to learn how to make them real in the culture that they're going to, relate to the people in that different culture. And that process is called contextualization. Must take the information from one context and make it meaningful in the new context. I grew up on the mission field. My parents were missionaries in the country of Pakistan. And when we were over there, uh, we often were asked, well, what do Americans eat? And we would say, well, Americans eat uh, hot dogs. OK? Hot dog is a favorite food in America. Garam kuta. We eat garam kuta. And they'd look at you like you were nuts. Because all they knew about dogs was these stray dogs that ran around in the <laughs> garbage dumps of their area. And they, you eat these hot dogs hot? You cook them and eat them? No, no, no. We're talking about hot dogs, not, well, it's garam kuta. Right. You see, you have to do something contextually. You have to cross some bridge. That is called contextualization. It happens all the time in missionary circles. But it happens all the time in preaching, too. You have to go through the contextualization process. Because their world is not our world. Example, Isaiah 118, though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. What if you have somebody who doesn't even know what snow is? Somehow you've got to go through the contextualization process in order for them to understand. Now, this is a diagram of the contextualization process. You can't short circuit this process. You can't go from here to here. If you do that, it will never work. Because you're bypassing an important process that retains the biblical authority in your preaching. If you just start over here what it meant to them, OK, that's what it, now what it means to me. Or even intended meaning and in what it means to me, 
you're bypassing an important process of contextualization that must take place in order for us to have the authority of scripture behind what we're saying. So you start with the intended meaning of the author. We've been talking about that. You look at the original life situation, Matthew 18, Jesus talking to the disciples there. And then you develop a biblical principle, you principalize it, and you transfer that into a contemporary principle, something that relates today. And then you develop a contemporary life parallel. Now you have to do that before you begin to get into the response that you want. So the CLP has to relate to the original life situation. A lot of times what happens is that we treat the original life situation, the context of those verses, say Matthew 18, since we just looked at that. We treat that context as sort of the husk on an ear of corn. So I get to, okay, I got to look at where they were, what they're doing, how that, you know, what's going on there. But I'm going to strip off that husk as fast as I can strip, strip it off because I want to get to the kernels, right? I want to get to the corn, so I'm going to strip off the husk. And when you do that, you will never develop CLPs because you just bypass the key ingredient for a CLP. A CLP, today's contemporary life parallel, should relate to that original life situation. That's how you're going to grasp what God is doing with this passage, what he wants to accomplish. That helps us figure that out. So don't treat it like the husk on an ear of corn and you just rip it off so you can get to the good stuff. Or as someone says, you boil the contents of the water until all that's left and distilled in the bottom is a bunch of dirt. That's not what we want to do. We want to understand that original life situation and parallel that as best as possible to today. So I've watched many preachers over the years struggle with this step, but I think it's a key step in applying the Bible to our lives. We tend to sometimes misapply the passage because we're not matching the parallels. Our words are not aligned with the Spirit's words so the preaching no, is no longer transformational if our words are not aligned to the Spirit's words. The contemporary life parable is not really parallel to the original life situation. It's just jumped to whatever we want. So the best way to make good application is to find contemporary life parallels that match the original situation. I'll give you a text. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, how do you hear that used quite frequently today? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Sports. Sports. That's where you hear it mostly, right? At least that's common for me. And somebody says, well... I'm up against a really tough opponent, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's his promise to me in this soccer match or this football game or whatever. That has nothing to do with the original life situation. It's an illegitimate purpose. It's an illegitimate application. And by the way, more, more heresy is taught in applications than anywhere else in the sermon. <laughs> or at least more abuse of the text is taught that way. I mean, what you want to do is figure out what are the key elements to the original life situation. So what's going on when Paul says that? What is his situa situation? Why does he write that? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What's happening? He's in prison. He's in prison. He's suffering for Christ because of his faith in Christ, because of his stand for Christ. So now how are you going to develop a CLP that reflects that original life situation? My people aren't in prison I'm preaching to in the congregation. 
So what am I going to do with that? Are you feeling pressure because of your All right. So key part of it is because of your faith, right? Because of, are you suffering or pressured in some way because of your faith? OK, you may not be in prison, so we're going to principalize it. We're going to take it from that context. But you still have to retain the core matters that are key in the context. And one of those is for your faith. Are you experiencing pressure or struggle because of your faith? So maybe a single mother whose non-Christian husband abandoned her with little children because, she, because of her faith in Christ. Now I can start to make a contemporary life parallel to the original life situation. Yeah, she's not in prison, but she's suffering and struggling because of her faith and the fact that her husband abandoned her and left her with three little children. Now I can take that and I can say, all right, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He can help you through this process. But that's because I took the original life situation and then began to look for a CLP that reflected that situation. So contemporary life parallels are very critically important. So work with the person next to you. 2 Corinthians 6.14, what CLPs do you see in this passage? Contemporary life parallels. Let's talk about universal needs. Because in one sense, transformational, we've got a few minutes left here. In one sense, transformational preaching addresses on Sunday the questions that our people are asking all week long. And really, we know we are successful when we're preaching transformationally. When people say, Pastor, it's like you were in my house this week, and <laughs> you know <laughs> the stuff we were talking about, our conversations, or that message is just for me. It's like you were preaching to me. Well, no, I didn't know anything about it. But it relates, you see. Uni there's, there's a certain amount of universal needs, that is, needs that all humanity have. So how do we develop a specific purpose for a specific sermon? We have to identify the needs of the people to whom we are speaking. And if you don't know those needs, then we have to discover them or understand universal needs. Henry Ward Beecher was a great preacher in American history, colonial American history, he confessed that he was a failure until he developed what he called the 40 basic you all knows. The 40 basic you all knows on which he focused his preaching. And then he constructed a series of sermons based upon those principles to just 17 men that he had gathered. And they responded to his message with enthusiasm. And he was so excited that he shouted, now at last I know how to preach. There are needs that people have commonalities of men and women all over the world. And we can aim the scriptures at those needs because the scriptures are intended to hit those needs. That's, by the way, why a preacher with a national ministry can still seem like they are applying things to our lives because they're addressing universal needs that we all feel, even though they don't know us. So we have to touch the lives of our people where they live each day without becoming so enmeshed in what we're saying that it's like we're speaking and we're picking them, you know, singling them out. So I developed, now many years ago now, I developed my own list of universal needs because I, I saw this in my own preaching. I, I, I knew that I needed to be more purposeful, intentional in what I wanted to accomplish in my sermons. So, Years ago, I developed my own list of universal needs. And I tried to make sure that my sermons address those universal needs. So here are some of those universal needs. Uh, I developed 15 of them that I think, by the way, I'm not talking about felt needs. I'm talking about real needs that people have. 
Salvation, to experience God's grace. Submission, to surrender to God's will. Purpose, to live for a reason. Hope, to face the future with confidence. Success, to be significant. Love, to, be, to love and be loved. Security, to be protected. Work, to do actions of value. Knowledge to know truth, wisdom to live well, discipline to exercise self-control, encouragement to experience community, peace to be content, worship to celebrate God, and justice to experience moral consistency. So what I tried to do years ago, I started doing this, is I tried to make sure that my sermon addressed one of those needs, or sometimes more than one. but. That, that I could see the text addressing these needs, these universal needs that people have. Because I believe that these are the needs that the Bible addresses, and that they are genuine needs that people have. So if I'm teaching, and I was teaching down in Panama, and we were dealing with some of these things, and these are, you know, one of the men, one of the pastors down there said, you know what? You're talking about the same things we deal with here. It doesn't matter where you're in the United States or in, you're in Panama, they're dealing with the same stuff, the stuff of human life. They're the same needs. Everybody needs, to, needs wisdom to live well. That's a universal need. Everybody needs discipline to exercise self-control in their life, and so on and so forth. So it doesn't matter whether I'm preaching in Morocco or Panama or Ukraine or places like that, they have those same needs. And I need to be addressing those with my sermon. So I want each sermon to address one or more of these needs. I, I want to actually know what I'm, so in my preparation for the sermon, I'm going to put down a purpose statement. This addresses uh, the need of discipline. This addresses what's my purpose here. I want to target that message. See how specific it gets for our sermons. Charles Simeon, in the 1700s, pastored Holy Trinity Church in Cambridge for 53 years. What a remarkable record, right? But he said he had three goals in his preaching. Number one, to humble the sinner. Number two, to exalt the Savior. And number three, to promote holiness. So he boiled it down to three. I've got 15. <laughs> eh, oh well. <laughs> but after Simeon took over the, the preaching during the vacation of the senior pastor, and Simeon eventually became the pastor, he followed the practice and he observed that in about six weeks, he said, a considerable stir was made among the dry bones. <laughs> well. When I'm preaching in churches, I'd like to see a considerable stir among the dry bones every once in a while, wouldn't you? It's good stuff. So what we do then is we understand that people have universal needs. And this isn't inspired. You can frame it how you want. But then we have to focus our content. We don't change the content. We focus it. Like a good photographer focuses the depth of field. You're going to zero in. So we can preach the same message, the same content, in two different settings with two different purposes. I can take a message, and I can preach it to you with a specific purpose that is different than the purpose I might use to preach to another group of people. Because that is variable. I'm focusing the content to, to arrive at the CLP that relates to those people's lives, the significance. Now, I've got to make sure it's connected. I don't want to be abusing it or misusing scripture, of course. So we can think through this focus by using this chart that helps us uh, with communication principles. The communication pyramid helps us form our purpose. Four categories. There's attention. Whoop. There's attention, comprehension, persuasion, and implementation. 
So attention, the need is enjoyment, the response is to enjoy, and the purpose to entertain. There's lots of communicators out there doing this at this level. But I was teaching this material at a, a conference a while ago, and um, somebody said, well, I don't like the term to entertain for us as preachers. How about the term to engage? I thought, you know what, that's a good term. I like to engage. So if you want to write in engage, that's, that's probably a little better sounding than to entertain. But you've got to get attention, is the point. Comprehension, need, explanation, response to understand, purpose to inform, persuasion, the need is proof, the response is to believe, the purpose is to persuade, and then implementation, put it into action, response to behave, so the purpose is now to motivate. Now, as preachers, what we want to do is we want to be up here. That's where we want to get. We've got to get to persuasion, ultimately to implementation, if we're going to have transformational sermons. Something's got to change in people's lives. They have to implement things in a different way than they were doing before. But here's the key to the communication pyramid. You can't do this without doing all of this. You can't get people motivated to change in some way until you persuade them to believe or to think in a different way. And you can't persuade until you get comprehension. They have to understand it. So you have to inform them. And you can't get comprehension until you get their attention. Well, I learned that lesson when my first, my first ministry, as a, I was a uh, children's minister, and I, I, had to, I had a group of children's church people, and I had to, to teach those children the word of God. I want to tell you, that is way harder than anything else I've ever done in terms of communication. Why? You work awfully hard at getting their attention, for one thing. <laughs> and then you try to get them to understand something, at least, and eventually get up here somehow in your children's lesson. But it's a real challenge. Those of you who have worked with kids, you know that, right? So we can't climb this ladder well, we can't get up here until we climb this ladder. So every sermon has to go through this process. Actually, quite frankly, most sermons do what? We get attention, we work our way up, now, we'll, now we're back down here halfway through the sermon, we're working our way back up, and the, the, we do this kind of thing throughout the sermon. Mark? I was, was going to ask, is that right? To do, are you doing that multiple Oh, yeah, absolutely, you have to. Now, you know, you know the experience, guys. You're preaching away. You, you got their attention. They were with you right away, and you know, and you've informed them. Now you get into persuasion, and you're, you're, you're really working it up, and you look out there, and there's little blank looks across their faces, and you realize, whoa, I just lost them. So what do you do when you lose them? <laughs> You've got to go back down, right? By the way, that's one of the purpose of illustrations. We haven't been talking about illustrations here. That's a topic for another time. But that's one of the purposes of an illustration, right? You've got to get back down here. Because if you've lost them, you can talk to your blue in the face. If they're not with you, it's not going anywhere, even if it's great stuff. So you're right, Mark. You go up and down like this through the course of a sermon. Now, you want to get, at the end of the sermon, you want to get here, otherwise it's not going to be transformational. But you'll get there at various points in the sermon. I don't believe that you should wait all the way to the end just to do one thing. You, want, you have an overarching goal, of course, but uh, you do it at the point in the sermon where, where you are. So if you've got an opportunity to climb that ladder and... and, and call for change, then you do so. Somebody had a hand over here. Um, I feel like, too, with each step you go up, you have to bring both uh, the steps below it as well. So let's say, uh, if, you're, if you sound like, you know, let's say you got their attention and you start, but then you start just to uh, have, like, no energy, you know? They're not, they're not going to comprehend it. They don't want to. So you have to always have their attention and then when you try to persuade them you have to 
has their attention and uh, they're comp for them to comprehend it. So this whole thing is to uh, go up the ladder, you know, you have to use all of them at once. You know, you can't just you know, get their attention and comprehend, you know, you have to keep on, you have to group them all together. Yeah, so that's a really good point. It, it's not, it's fluid. It, this isn't a, a, a cut and dried cut off all the way. This is a very fluid process, and, and that's the art of preaching. You know, we talk, about, we, we talk about the science of preaching and the art of preaching. That's the art of preaching. Is, it's a very fluid process that you're dealing with here. But here's part of the, the part of the issue with transformational preaching is we have to be intentional in our preparation to do this, but we're, we're shining a, spot, a spotlight on some issue that we're trying to accomplish in our preaching. And it means that we often have to cut out good stuff that doesn't accomplish that goal. And that, too, is part of effective transformational preaching because it's a, it's a rifle, not a shotgun. Can you say that stuff today? Um, so you have to cut out some things that don't, keep, don't help us hit the target because our goal is to hit the target. Too many sermons meander about where the preacher does all kinds of things, talks about all kinds of things. What's he doing? He's playing marbles with diamonds because you got to cut some of that stuff out so that you get to the point. I, I was watching a YouTube on photography, something I try to learn a little bit about every once in a while. And I was watching this YouTube by a professional photographer named Andy Mumford. I think he's from England. Um, and um, I, he, he said, that he made this statement, and I, I backtracked the video, so I gotta write that down. So I wrote that statement down, and I have it over my desk where I prepare my sermons. Because this is, this is a great statement. In photography as in life, the most important mathematics is subtraction. Subtract all that is distracting and unnecessary until only the essential remains. Do that with your sermons, guys. You've got to if you want to be transformational in your preaching. Because what happens is, is there's so much distraction out there that you're throwing so many things out there and people pick up on one of them and where do their minds go? Whoosh, over here. And somebody else is going over there. So be careful. The most important skill probably is subtraction. As you're preparing to preach, getting rid of the things that will take people away from the target of your sermon, what it is you're trying to accomplish, and what it is you believe God wants you to accomplish with that sermon, with that passage. So I keep that right over my desk to help me. I thought that was a great comment. So let's. Uh, we're, we're at the end here. What do you want this sermon to do? Critical importance. It should be the leading question behind every sermon we preach. Let me pull this, some of this stuff together as we close uh, this session. Take your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So you're familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Of course, the famous passage, 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5, where Paul says, my message and my preaching, my logos and my kerygma were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. And so he's going on about preaching and all that, uh, all that preaching is and how we are God-dependent learners. So we can be intentional about our purpose, and we should be intentional about our purpose, but the driving force in any change, any transformation is who? God the Spirit. Without God the Spirit changing lives, nothing's happening. It doesn't absolve us from our responsibility to work hard at being intentional and target well, but we must understand that it is the power of the Spirit of God that changes lives. That's Paul's strong point here in 1 Corinthians 2. 
But the verse I want to tie into is verse 13. Because I think there's a clue to how we do this right here in this verse that Paul is, is emphasizing. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.13, because he's still continuing that topic. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the Spirit. So he's continuing that thought. But here's the phrase. Combining spiritual ideas with spiritual words. Combining spiritual ideas with spiritual words. Now, there's a variety of ways the Greek text can be translated here, but I think that's probably the best one right there. Combining spiritual thoughts or words with spiritual words. So, when we're preaching, there is a convergence of the Spirit's words, or the Spirit's ideas, I should say, with our words. That's what he's talking about, combination, this convergence between the Spirit's ideas that we're seeing in Scripture and our words. There's form and there's substance to every sermon. And we are in that process of, co- of seeing that convergence take place. So our sermons become spirit-directed and spirit-empowered when our words are aligned with the ideas of God in his word. Our message is then his message. Our message, when that convergent of, convergence of his ideas and our words takes place, then it is one message. It's his message. And then there's real transformational power. Martin Lloyd-Jones called the moment when this convergence takes place the unction of the Holy Spirit. John Owen put it this way, if the word does not dwell with power in us, it will not pass with power from us. The unction is in the word of God. It's in the ideas of God. The power is in the scripture because God always accomplishes his purpose. And the degree to which our words match the ideas of the spirit is the degree to which our sermon will be transformational. That's why we must work so hard to expose the ideas of God the Holy Spirit. The transformational preaching is using our words, the form of our sermon, to expose God's ideas. Why is that so important? Because the Spirit of God doesn't live in my words. The Spirit of God does not live in your words. The Spirit of God lives in His Word, the Word of God. So our sermon must do what God wants His Word to do. Anything less is what? playing marbles with diamonds.